Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Kalise Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Before we get into today's show, we had a couple of points we didn't quite get to tackle on the air about holiday recycling from yesterday's show. Number one, a question from listener Becky Gorge. <laughs> Gorge. Becky George. <laughs> Not Gorge, like Gully. <laughs> but she's gorgeous. She is gorgeous. Uh, but Becky George asked, can you recycle ribbons and bows from presents or tinsel from trees? Answer? No. Either reuse them or toss them in the Le Garbage. <laughs> and number two in the surprisingly not recyclable category is cardboard ice cream and frozen food containers. Seems weird and unlikely, but it's true. Anything from frozen food where the food touches the container, that container is not recyclable. That was a shocker to my partner last night. I had to tell him immediately. It was a shocker to me when I found out about that yesterday. Right? But see yesterday's podcast because there was a bunch of excellent information about what you can and can't recycle for the holidays. Yes, and we'll talk with them again at some point. But with that, back to, day, to today's show. Coming up, a DIY punk show to benefit trans kids coming to Florence. We'll talk with Kevin Schmidt about how punk rock is helping to translate gender. And we'll hear about a farm share program where you can get your standard veggies with your share, but where you can also get Christmas trees and pie. We'll talk with Lenita Bober from Blossoming Acres Farm in Southwick. But speaking of farms... Yesterday on the show, we heard from Phil Corman of CISA, which is one of the organizing bodies behind the Massachusetts Farm Resiliency Fund, about the $3.3 million that that public-private partnership that was initiated by Governor Healy's office gave out to 228 farmers $3.3 million in that Farm Resiliency Fund. And while pretty much while we were having that conversation, a press release went out about $20 million coming from Beacon Hill and the Natural Disaster Recovery Program for Agriculture. We're speaking with the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, a fifth generation dairy farmer from Deerfield, right here in the 413, and proud to say, multiple time marcher for the food bank, who I didn't get enough time to talk with uh, on that march because I was at the at the top with a shopping cart most of the time, Ashley Randall. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Monty and Khalees. It's great to be with you, and especially when we've got good news to share coming out of the administration to help our farmers. Right. It's been a lot of bad news in the first half of the year, the first seven months of the year, but this is kind of a little bit of a light at the end of a very, very long wet tunnel. Yeah. It's more of a bomb than anything else, but rather sure. than good news, because it looks like the fact that we have a natural disaster recovery program now instituted, that this is something that we're going to have to prepare for for the future. Uh, for those who haven't been following, where did this $20 million come from, Commissioner Randall? The $20 million was allocated through the legislature, and we were really fortunate to have advocates in the Western Mass delegation and Senator Comerford and Representative Blay who took this to Beacon Hill and really advocated to help support farmers in the Valley. And Senate President Spilka jumped right on board, wanting to help the farming community as well as Chair Rodericks. And so this passed through the supplemental budget and was supported by the administration. So the reason that it was just announced yesterday is, as some people may have been following, too, the end of the legislative session, both between the Democrats and the very few Republicans on Beacon Hill, got a, a little contentious, acrimonious, hard to figure out. But once they worked out those details, this is how this money has now been allowed to, to move forward? Correct. Mm -hmm. And we were fortunate. So back in August, this had been advocated for. And in September, we were able to stand up the program understanding that it would be a $20 million program. And our department, having never been able to provide this opportunity to farms before, really worked to create an equitable program where we could meet the needs of as many farmers as possible across the state. We know how the the Farm Resiliency Fund released its funds for farms. Like It was kind of a no questions asked. Like The first round was a blanket 10 grand and the further tiers were based on need. How was this particular fund allocated to the farms that, that were involved? Sure. So for our program, we looked at the range of crops that we knew were impacted across the three weather events. And that's a difference too from the Mass Farm Resiliency Fund is that was meant to be a quick fund to go from flood to fund response in less than a few weeks and really address the needs in Western and Central Mass from the flood impacts. 
Our natural disaster recovery program covers the February 4th freeze impacts, the May 18th frost, and the July 10th flooding and ongoing flood events that occurred throughout the summer. And so we knew that it was going to be a broader universe. So when we looked at developing our application, we tried to look at the most common crops that we had heard were impacted and make sure that there was a fair market value assessed for those crops and farms could receive up to $350,000 in terms of direct aid. When we launched the program, the response was tremendous. And we recognized at the end of it that there was over 65 million in crop losses that farms had incurred across these three weather events. And for our program specifically, we received 42 million in requests. And some of that is because farms had crop insurance or GoFundMes or the Mass Farm Resiliency Fund to help fill in the gaps for funding. So we were able to fund about half of that 42 million in requests. We're speaking with Commissioner Ashley Randall from the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, MDAR, which is in the Mustafar system. Um, <laughs> I have to make a Star Wars joke about MDAR as an acronym all the time. Um, you mentioned that you know this is $20 million, which is not an uh, insubstantial amount of money, but that there was still so much greater. Do, you, do we feel like the mix of insurance and the other funds has covered the losses in its entirety? Would there be another round? of funding to help continue to cover the losses of this past year? I think that we were able to cover a significant amount of the losses. I think fortunately, initially when the floods happened, some of the farms were projecting total crop losses, but through disease mitigation and just waiting out to see how the rest of their harvest played out, they were able to actually harvest maybe 75% of their crop or 50% when initially they thought it was going to be 100% crop loss. So I will say that in terms of the fund and other funding sources, and certainly the Mass Resiliency Fund was critical in those first few weeks and that first month after the weather event to be able to help cover labor. And so farms wouldn't have to lay off employees if they didn't have crops to harvest, but they still had work on the farm to do. So that really helped to fill in the gap in the short term. And we recognize that with infrastructure and other areas that farms may have lost, they want to be able to now look forward and plan for next year in terms of their resiliency. And our fund can help them through that effort. Along those lines, uh, our cohort in the newsroom, Adam Frenier, is asking if there is any part of this fund, the building thereof, that is helping farmers plan for these disasters happening in the future. So through this fund, it's really raised the role of the climate crisis and how this is going to impact farms and our agricultural community and local food system for years to come. The climate crisis is here, and it's, as we've seen this year, more extreme than ever in terms of the weather impacts. So what we've looked at at the administration level is how our policies can better assist farms going forward so they are more resilient and they can continue to farm just maybe in a different way. And a lot of it is creative solutions. And through our grant programs, for instance, we have a climate smart agriculture program at the department that can help farms with anything from irrigation systems in years when they face a drought or for years like we saw this year, it may be frost prevention for orchards. And local farmer Ben Clark will tell you that he may be using some of his funds to to look at those preventative measures going forward. And I think that our fund is able to fill the gaps for resiliency that farms haven't been able to do before Mm -hmm. because we haven't had a program of this type. So it's an opportunity for us to look at our programs and how we can adapt them as we move forward to support the farming community in these times of crisis and climate change. 
We're speaking with Ashley Randall, the commissioner for the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, about the $20 million to farms impacted by severe weather throughout 2023 in the new Natural Disaster Recovery Program for Agriculture. This, as you mentioned, Commissioner, was part of a supplemental budget. We've seen a lot of initiatives begin as uh, supplemental funding or maybe a grant initiated from the federal government, things like the Healthy Incentives Program, the state-level idea about universal free school meals, and have seen those things be built into the overall state budget after a course of several years, given that we're not anticipating that we will have fixed the planet by budget cycle 2024 or budget cycle 2025, are we anticipating that this natural disaster recovery program is going to be part of state government going forward? Through our colleagues in the legislature, there have been conversations about setting up a potential trust in the future to be able to build up this funding and have this as a tool in our toolbox for when we do have to deal with these type of events in the future. And hopefully 2024 doesn't present this trifecta of challenges again for farmers, Mm. but we're all having these conversations at the administration level, at the legislature level. And I would also say in the private sector, when we look at the businesses and organizations that support farms, and the Mass Resiliency Fund, where you have that public-private partnership to figure out ways going forward that we can have these funding sources should we need them in times of crisis. Coming up, how many of these farms receiving the $20 million in funds from Beacon Hill are in the 413? And do they have the cash in hand? More with Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources Commissioner Deerfield's Ashley Randall. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. We're speaking with Ashley Randall, the commissioner for the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, about the $20 million to farms impacted by severe weather throughout 2023 in the new Natural Disaster Recovery Program for Agriculture. You are the commissioner of agriculture for the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts, despite the fact that you're a fifth generation dairy farmer from our neck of the woods here (laughs) in Deerfield. Um, This has gone to 347 farms, this $20 million throughout the Commonwealth. Is there a percentage breakdown about you know, Western Mass versus Central versus Eastern Mass about how much money or how many farms are in which location that received this money? I will say that based upon the flood events, the the majority of the funding through this program, we did see a lot of those requests come in based on the July flood events. So that's where you have Western and Central Mass receiving primarily a bulk of the funding for those events. But when you look at the frost and freeze events, those impacted orchards across the state. So without breaking it down into percentages, I can say that the entire state was impacted by the frost and freeze events. And we did see a lot of losses early on in the season of the peach and apple and grape and pear crops because of those two weather events. And then with the flooding, as I said, it was really Western Mass and Central Mass based, and then a few scattered impacts across the state. Looking at the list of farms that received funds through this and uh, notice a couple of cranberry farms. I'm like, huh, I wonder what the effect was on cranberries because I have no idea. Yeah, you kind of want to flood cranberries, but uh, maybe not at the particular time that they were being flooded. And maybe if they were flowering, like maybe I don't know how their flowering process worked, but maybe the frost was the thing that did them in, too. I'm just curious. <laughs> you you are know. correct, Calise. <laughs> with, with the earlier frost and freeze events, those were actually where the cranberry bog were impacted. And when we talk about some of those preventative measures where you need certain temperatures, right place, right time, as well as when you flood the bogs or have those preventative frost measures in place, sometimes it's hard with either equipment failures. If the temperature drops too quickly, that may have an impact on the bog owners being able to provide that resilient atmosphere for their crop. And so that was what we saw with the cranberries this year. With this $20 million to these 347 farms from the Natural Disaster Recovery uh, Program from Beacon Hill, Commissioner Ashley Randall, are these funds uh, restricted in any way? Can they be used on anything the farm may have needed? Do they need to specifically spell out what they needed after the disasters? Or how are these funds going to be allocated individually farm to farm? 
These funds are at the discretion of the farm. So in their application, they indicated to us what their crop losses were. And now for them, it's the ability to have the flexibility to be able to use the funds, whether it's to cover labor costs, whether it's to rebuild lost infrastructure, plan for next season and potential mitigation equipment that they want to purchase, whether it's an irrigation system. The opportunities for this program are great because it is flexible and it is direct aid to the farms. What's the most one farm received versus the least? Was there a a benchmark like you couldn't apply for more than X amount of dollars? So the maximum award amount that a farm could receive was $350,000. So some farms did have millions in crop losses based on the timing of the season and their acreage amounts. Mm. But in terms of a minimum, some farms that may have been smaller scale or had one crop that they lost, we awarded a few thousand dollars. But for those farms, we recognized whether it was a small farm or one of the ones that had larger impacts, they were greatly appreciative of having this ability to use the funds in a flexible manner. Did anyone receive that full 350000 And if so, are they from this area? You don't have to necessarily mention them by name, but I, are there farms that are that large that lost that much individually here in the four counties of Western Mass? Yes, there are several farms. Um, when you look at the different industries and the markets, there's so much support in the Western Mass community for local farms. And a lot of those market channels were disrupted because farms that grow sweet corn or potatoes Mm. and they're selling to Big Y or to UMass Dining Services, a lot of those crops were impacted. And so it was significant losses for them and their total volume that they were able to ultimately sell. I hate to ask a a downer of a question, (laughs) but... um, Have you heard stories of farms who, despite this fund and despite the Farm Resiliency Fund, just could not overcome the losses of this past year? Is there a percentage of farms and agriculture that we've lost entirely that don't seem to be able to recover? To my knowledge, I have not heard of any farms that are not continuing into next growing season because of this year's (laughs) impacts. Oh, that's good. So... So that's a positive, not not a negative question at all, Khalees. Okay. Actually, it was a good a good setup to say that through these funds and just through the overall resiliency and determination of our farming community in Massachusetts and how they all pulled together to support one another, which I think is really unique uh, to the Commonwealth and across the country, is how farmers supported each other through these natural disasters so that they all could survive into next season and be able to continue on with their farming operations. Oh, good. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) (laughs) That is good news. The the press release about this $20 million in disaster relief uh, just came out yesterday, Commissioner Ashley Randall from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. Does that mean the checks are already out too? Or or is it just the press release and the checks are forthcoming? Do the farmers, these 347 farmers, already have access to this cash? So I'm pleased to say that because of the volume of contracts, we, as of last week, we were able to start notifying farms of their awards, and we already have over 100 contracts that have been signed, so about a third of the contracts, and we've already made about 25 payments to the farms to be able to start spending as soon as they received their check. So the funds are already going out and I know the farmers have plans for what they would like to do with the funds as soon as they receive them. Has this sort of unprecedented climate year encouraged your department or other parts of legislation to maybe build more of like either a committee or groups to specifically look at some of the climate things that are affecting agriculture in order to help you and the state provide possible relief for things that might arise? Absolutely. At the department level, we started a internal climate task force and our team has representatives from each of our divisions who can offer a unique per- unique perspective to the climate crisis and climate change. And so we meet on a monthly basis to look at our programs and policies 
as well as other states and federal policies to see where there's areas that we might want to see changes or amendments made so they are more responsive and more reflective of Northeast farmers and our Massachusetts farmers. One example I would say in talking with our colleagues in the legislature and the administration is when we talk about crop insurance and some industries based upon the type of crop that they're growing have very responsive crop insurance. But in Massachusetts, our farms are very diversified. And so crop insurance typically doesn't benefit them. And we saw that this summer because they are so diversified that they don't get adequate coverage when they do have crop losses. So looking at USDA and the opportunity through the farm bill to be able to update crop insurance so it is more reflective of our industries here in the state is one critical area that both the legislature and the administration has identified that would be beneficial to our farmers. Before we let you go, Commissioner Ashley Randall from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, we started this conversation by saying that you're a fifth generation dairy farmer from Deerfield. You're the first woman to be in this role as the commissioner. How did your family's farm fare in 2023 with all of the climatological disasters oh, that we experienced? This is a great segue because I did. there's a lot of livestock farms on this list. Yeah. And I don't think anybody's really thought of how the events of this year actually inf- impact those farms as well. Yes. So that's a great question, Monty and Khalees. I will say that personally at my family's farm, some of our grazing pastures were flooded out. So that's a critical source of feed for our animals that we have. And for many of the livestock farms that you see on the list, they have corn that they feed to their animals as well as hay that either the corn crop was a total loss from the flood events or their hay fields they couldn't access because we would see a few dry days but not long enough where then there was another rainstorm that would come through. So typically you hear farms talking about a third cutting or even fourth cutting and this year some farms only got a first cutting And the quality of the hay feed was always a concern because there is that potential for mycotoxins from the rain events to develop once you harvest the hay crop. So livestock operations were impacted as well. So some of this funding will likely help the livestock farms in terms of purchasing feed to help their animals through the winter and and into next year. Ashley Randall is the commissioner of the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, originally from right here in the 413, talking today about the $20 million from Beacon Hill that was part of a supplemental budget that's there to assist farmers who had to struggle through all of the climatological events of this year nearly gone by with the new Natural Disaster Recovery Program for Agriculture. Thank you so much for explaining how this all worked and how the farmers are going to benefit from our tax dollars to hopefully make it through another growing season. Thank you, Monty and Khalees. I'm glad we could share some good news heading into the holidays. Oh, yeah. During the show, we'll hear from one of the 347 farmers who received emergency relief funds. But we're more excited to talk about their pies and donuts and how somehow, magically, that is available with their farm share. A local hero spotlight on the way with Lenita Bober from Blossoming Acres Farm in Southwick. Up next, DIY punk rock to support trans kids. We'll hear about a night of punk and stuff with Kevin Schmidt of Happy Fun Time Cult. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. This Friday at JJ's Tavern in Florence is a benefit for trans youth Film and Gender, The Problem with Kids Today, and Happy Fun Time Cult with special guests, A Night of Punk and Stuff to Benefit, Translate Gender. And joining us is the curator of this event, which sounds like it's going to be super fun, Kevin Schmidt. Kevin, you are a punk rock aficionado that's trying to create a punk rock scene, and you are noticing things about punk rock and who's attending these punk rock shows here locally. Yes, well, I wanted to have a show and I've been going to shows lately and there's been a lot of more out transgendered people and there's a branch called Queer Core mm-hmm. and it just seemed that there was a lot of you know need for something and I work in a school so I asked around and there was an organization that worked in the schools so I wanted to have a you know a benefit concert anyways hooked up with Translate Gender 
it's a good organization. They have meetings for the parents who get together and they talk about, you know, the troubles and tribulations and all that. And they also celebrate all the joys and happiness that their children are going through now, which, you know, just 10 years ago probably wouldn't have even happened, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, Translate Genders website says that they're rewriting access for trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people in relationship, family, and community. They are a, a 501c3 nonprofit, and they seem to do a lot of work, as you were mentioning, with, uh, with family members as well as individuals. What have you seen that's changed about the punk scene in the area? Because, like, I remember going to shows at, like, the Red Cross and at the Barn in, in Amherst, like, my band doing shows in basements all around the valley, but besides seeing more out transgender people and more LGBTQIA plus folks on instruments and just rocking out, what have you seen change about the punk scene in the area? Well, I mean, it's kind of thin. Mm -hmm. I would like to start like an organization where you could go, and if you got a punk band and you're looking for a show, you want to open for people, you can just go and put your name in and you know, hey, bang, you want to be in a show, bang. <laughs> That's What's more punk rock there, than that? Right? <laughs> yeah, well, there isn't really a lot of, there's not a lot of venues. I would like to eventually book two shows a month, you know, at two different places. I mean, they got all those bluegrass festivals and stuff. Mm-hmm. I would like a loud music festival, you know? <laughs> I would like something for me. Right. I'm a little mad that the Dropkick Murphys played at a bluegrass festival. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> but they wanted like 300 bucks for tickets, too. And I'm like, eh, no. Yeah, they played at Freshgrass, the at... bluegrass festival at Mass Mocha back right. in the late in the fall. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I used to see them at, at Pearl Street. They would open for people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're an awesome band, but I'm not paying 300 bucks for them. <laughs> there, you know? is, there is something about that that is distinctly against, like, it's the so core not of punk rock, punk rock spirit. Yes. <laughs> That's right. And we're speaking with Kevin Schmidt, who is behind the benefit for trans youth happening this Friday at JJ's Tavern. Re- is Film and Gender one of the names of the band? It is one of the names of the band. Yeah. They're a two-piece. Yeah. They're really cool. Okay. And then the pop- uh, They're awesome. I yeah. went to saw. I went to a show, and they were there. It was the first time I ever saw them. And first of all... There was, I think, eight basses, um, two drummers, <laughs> five singers at, at, at like this show. It, it was the weirdest punk rock show I'd ever been to. Like they didn't have like full bands, but Film and Gender came out. And I'm like, what is this, man? A bass and a drum, and they just wiped the floor with everybody there. They're such a powerful, powerful act. Straight ahead, like subversive lyrics and s- delivered with such beautiful sneer. They're really great lives. And where are they from? They're from right around here. I think they're from Westfield, maybe. It's funny because the names of these punk rock bands are alluding to things that this benefit is for and alluding to what you were saying, Kevin Schmidt, about like the uh, ever queerening of the punk scene and the gender nonconformity that film and gender is one of the bands. The problem with kids today, which I'm sure is something that these kids that are that are on this spectrum are dealing with from grown-ups. Tell, tell us about that band, The Problem With Kids Today. The lead singer walked into a bar, and uh, I was like, holy crap, that is a rock star. You know? <laughs> when you see their videos, it's kind of the same thing, too. Not so much in your face, a little bit poppier, but like, wow, are they yeah. catchy. They're super catchy, and they're about to come out with their debut album, too. It's going to be a pile of fun. They're great on stage. And this is all sponsored by the Happy Fun Time Cult, spelled K-U-L-T. Tell us about Happy Fun Time Cult. Oh, that's us. Yeah. <laughs> I figured. That's us. I We're, figured. Uh, I'm, I've been around the Valley for a long time. I've been in a lot of different bands. I, it was time. I, I hadn't had a band for a while, and uh, we're ready to go and offend people. <laughs> have a good time. <laughs> this this event is co-sponsored by uh, Platterpus Records. How did you get them on board with supporting the event? I called Dave up and asked him, and uh, Dave is Dave's a great guy, man. He's been supporting. I mean, we used to drop our tapes off, and he would sell them for us if he could sell them. You know, cool. If not, he'd give us a buck or two. Mm-hmm. You know, and he, he, back in the day, he was the man. He's still the man. You know? He's and still the man. We yeah. had him on oh, the show definitely. before. Damien I mean, House from Platterpus Records. He's a, he's a gem. Yeah, and he had, uh, you know, this was Schwaber, Mark Schwaber from, like, Hospital, and Mark Schwaber and came from. And he's an awesome voice in the Valley, too. It's time, too. It's time for music to come back. Live music needs to come back. You know, punk rock comes back when society is on a skid. And 
a lot of times we can help at least point out that we're on a skid. We're the voice of the voiceless, and it's it's time. So that's why I was trying to bring punk rock back. And it's nice to see all these other people who are thinking the same thing. These young kids who are out there, film and gender are grinding out show after show every, you know, basements and in town halls and in libraries and stuff all over the place. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. I'm too old to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> so you say, but I don't know. I'm still up for carrying my amp down stairs that are way too narrow for yeah. it because there's something about the energy of basement shows and like shows in places you wouldn't necessarily expect that is unlike being on real stages. There's just something about the DIY of it that's really invigorating. Sure. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I remember... But we, if you got, there used to be a place in Northampton that they used to have, uh, you know, those row houses out yeah. in back of like uh, Joe's. Mm -hmm. yeah. There used to be a there used to be an attic up there, man. I, I saw the Hutus play up there, and uh, it was amazing. It was dangerous though because everyone kept slamming their head into the roof. <laughs> The moshing was a little uh, rough. Yeah. Yes. Same thing in like Holyoke and Chicopee too. Like the where the Cubit is now was a warehouse where the second floor used to be <clears throat> like performance space. <clears throat> yes. Oh, also I wanted to mention that Porch Rat will be playing <clears throat> between sets. I found an acoustic rocker to come and play between sets, so it's a little something different. And his name is Porch Rat. Don't call him Portrait because he gets really mad. So don't <laughs> chant Portrait, Portrait. It's Porch Rat. Porch Rat. Yeah. It's Porch Rat, not Portrait. He gets mad. Yeah. People have been yelling awful things when my band Man's Laughter has been performing. Uh, yeah. Terrible. I, 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 hey, I'm dyslexic. You're talking to the wrong guy. Uh, I couldn't get that one together. Sorry. No, it's okay. Kevin Smith who is behind the Happy Fun Time cult, putting on this benefit for trans youth and translate gender, which seems like a great organization, bringing the punk rock back with film and gender, the problem with kids today, and the Happy Fun Time cult, as well as Porch Rat, uh, this Friday, December 15th, 7 o'clock, 18 plus, JJ's Tavern in Florence, which is creating its own, I hope this is the epicenter of the punk scene. It's already trying to build a comedy scene there. It's well, it's, building, it's always been a lot, but there's something about like the, the lo-fi shows. There's, there's a place that's just opened up in Northampton called Everything Must Go. And I feel like that, not nothing against JJ's, literally my band just played there, but that place is going to be the center of Oh, it. cool. I love it. Well, I love that the scene, that there's a punk scene that is reforming here. Kevin, really quickly, is Translate Gender going to be tabling at this event? Uh, they're working the door. I paid for the venue, and they're just going to take care of all the money so I don't have to touch it. I told <laughs> them to make sure to bring some flyers and stuff. And also, if Portrait remembers, he works for a rehab that deals with transgender and queer community too, so I told them to bring some flyers down, too. Sweet. So there's folks that you can talk to about these organizations should you come. Fun there time. you go. Kevin Schmidt from the Happy Fun Time Cult and the Benefit for Trans Youth happening this Friday at 7 p.m. at JJ's Tavern. Thank you so much. Hey, no problem. Just remember, join the cult. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, we're all for getting veggies with our farm shares, but veggies plus pies and a Christmas tree seems like the best of all the holiday worlds. A local hero spotlight on the way with Lenita Bober from Blossoming Acres Farm in Southwick. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Do people joining your CSA ever request crops for the next year? Uh, we've had a lot of people talk about things that they would like to see, and we try to do that if we can. Cool. Uh, different types of pumpkins, neck pumpkins was something that someone requested for next year neck. and I neck. did find seed. It's an old fashioned butternut with a very neck. So if you want to make neck. a really cool. creepy looking jack-o-lantern, you've got a yeah. head pumpkin <laughs> and a neck pumpkin. And a neck pumpkin. Now That's I need right. a torso pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> this way lies madness. <laughs> no one wants whatever you're planning on waking up next, <laughs> next Halloween. It's before Christmas. Yeah. Jack Skellington. <laughs> it's a different nightmare before Christmas. Right. <laughs> This is the time of year when I've already resigned myself to basically saying my body wants to be 10 to 15 pounds heavier to uh, avoid 
<laughs> the cold that is always trying to penetrate it, so I might as well just lean in. And it is time for a local hero spotlight with Jacob Nelson from CISA, the local hero folks, and Lanita Bober, the owner of Blossoming Acres Farm and Farm Stand in Southwick. And you have brought lots of stuff here to help me add to my layer of blubber that will keep me warm and cozy this holiday season. Yes, we have. <laughs> before we get to, before we're not making any sort of apology no, about no. this. Like, no. no. Pie is good and good for you. Yes. And so are donuts sometimes. That's yeah. right. So is joy. Yeah, so you know? is joy. Exactly. And that's really what we're bringing. Like, that's the, right. Blossoming the this serotonin time. boost that you get from eating sweets every once in a while is a real good thing in these terrible dark times. Yeah. Yes. We Gen- never see the sun. So Jennifer Lawrence, the actress, said food tastes better than skinny feels. So I think I, that's something to, to live up to. But before we get into the stuff that we have been alluding to, let's talk about the healthier stuff for a little bit. You at your farm in Southwick have 80 acres of mixed veggies and flowers as well. That's 80. That's a pretty big farm. It is. Yeah. It is. It keeps me busy. You're obviously probably not growing too much there right now on the farm, but you're getting ready for the next season already, and you're encouraging people to get ready and involved with your season next season. Yes. We're already, I'm already ordering seeds, planning for next year, hoping for better weather for next year. Yeah, aren't we all? Then we had this year. We have a CSA. We open up an early enrollment program the 1st of December because it makes a good Christmas present for families. Yeah. So, And our CSA program is a little different than most. You get a card, a gift card. Uh, You can get anything in the store that we produce or make, or we make soups and meals and grow vegetables, and you can use it on plants, all kinds of stuff. The only thing that's excluded is things that we bring in on commission, yeah. of course. That's so, really cool. Yeah, yeah. And then 10 times out of the season, you get a freebie. Um, you get an email. If we're picking a lot of tomatoes, it may be tomatoes. Could be anything. P- people really like it. It's become it's become a big part of our business. And it's interesting because a lot of the ways that a lot of farm shares work is you go, you sign up in advance so that the farmers can have some cash to work with getting into the season, which is a great thing to do if you want to support farmers. Yes. And then they, you show up whenever they say, or they deliver to your house, a box of whatever they have. But right. this way is more like a debit card model where your card is loaded with X amount of dollars and you use it for exactly what you want in your store. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. They can come in anytime through the year and it never runs out. You can keep coming all year long. You can get pie. Or and, donuts. <laughs> and, you know, I've been part of multiple farm shares over the course of years. And it's like if you miss your week, mm-hmm. your pickup, you might be out of luck that right. week. But yeah. that doesn't happen if you use this, no. right? No. You can stock up. Yeah. Yeah. Never runs out. <laughs> Are there sizes to your CSA? Like some people have large and small and like individual things. We do a suggested size. Like mm. we start with a with a, a $200 program. And the biggest one that we suggest is a 600 But really we will anything over 200 that you want to tailor to your family will make it work. It's a good program. This is among the most flexible versions of a CSA that I have ever seen here in the Valley, which is really cool. It's also a gift to your farm because Mm -hmm. as you're thinking ahead to 2024, you get a much clearer picture of at least what the financial outlook is going to be for your farm and what you're capable of. Yep, we can't right. predict what the weather next year is going to be. It'd be great if we could. Mm-hmm. But we can predict this, and that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it's a, it's a win-win for sure for us and for the customers. We're speaking with Lenita Bober, who is the owner of Blossoming Acres Farm and Farm Stand in Southwick. And we've alluded to um, hoping for better weather in 2024. Um, and we spoke with Phil Corman from CESA, the local hero folks, about the Massachusetts Farm Resiliency Fund and the amount of money that mm-hmm. that has put out to our farmers on yesterday's show. But you were one of the recipients of some of that money, as well as a, a, a grant through CESA. You want to talk a little bit about how that has helped your farm make it through 2023? It was a huge, a huge help. We got some some a grant from CESA and also a grant from the Department of Agriculture. It was the wettest year that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And we lost about 16 acres of produce. And for us, we're not right down by the river. Um, and I feel so bad for the farms that were that were just completely flooded out. Yeah. And it was terrible. And you saw it on the news and it was dramatic. But you didn't see the farms a little further up. On the other side of the on the sides of the valley that we dealt with just as much rain mm-hmm. and all our low spots just you know I had corn that never got above a foot high because it just the roots just drowned. Yeah, having CESA and having the Department of Agriculture step up and help us kind of close the gap was a huge huge help to get us through the year. 
So the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, thanks to our local legislators, had $20 million to distribute yes. to farms that were impacted by this year's extreme weather through the Natural Disaster Recovery Program. Yes. And then the other funds that you're speaking about, that was the um, was at the CESA and the Community Foundation of Western Mass and the United Way. Yes, the, the Farm Resilient. Resiliency Fund. Farm the one that was started so by the governor's office. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. From yeah. both of those. So yes. that's great to know that they really helped you out this they year. They did. Yeah, yeah. It was huge. It and was, good to know that they dovetail the way that they intended them mm-hmm. to, which is really nice. Different paychecks rolling out right. different times right. and some very early on before the legislature had figured out what they were going to be able to do and allocate from Beacon Hill. And, and, yes, yeah, so. exactly. It was a, a huge sigh of relief for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just to talk about your CSA a little bit more when did you make the decision to make it so broad? Because, again, like this is kind of innovative in the way that you've approached it, more like a standard farmer's market where you get like your SNAP stuff and you can use it across the board. Mm-hmm. But like other markets that have other products don't necessarily offer, offer them on the same playing field as this. When did that change come about for your CSA? Well, the first CSA that we did was for an insurance company where we packed up the boxes and we brought them to the insurance company and dropped them off. And then it was a lot of work every week to put all those boxes together. And we do two farmers markets a week on top of the stand. So when we thought about a CSA for the store, just to think about pack, you know, packing all those boxes got a little overwhelming. And then I started to think and I heard people say through our other CSA, well, I don't like kale or I don't like broccoli. You know, they wanted some choices. And that's when I kind of came up with the idea. And I had heard about some other places starting to do this type of thing. So we came up with this program and people love it. They can get what they want. They don't have to take what they don't like. When we do have the freebies, like for pickling cukes or tomatoes or thing, we send an email out. They get a week to come and get it, so they have time to buy canning products or you know whatever they need. That was another complaint that we heard. With the other boxes, we got all this stuff. We're not ready to deal with it, and we can't use it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this gives them the time to to prepare. Right. Yeah. So many times I'm so. like bok choy. What do I do now? Right. <laughs> right. You make kimchi. I don't have time for kimchi. That's, like, that's exactly <laughs> the thing. A lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> so let me just get this straight, Lenita. You've, you've created a CSA, a market-style CSA, with this charge card that you could use on kale or these cider donuts that I have in front of me. Absolutely. Do people still actually get kale? <laughs> Not usually. Uh, more donuts. <laughs> no, I'm gonna pass, a lot pass of around these cider you have to donuts get both to taste so now. that you can balance yourself out. And that's the part that I think is like most fascinating. Like the stuff from your bakery, the stuff from your deli is a, is available to this too. And that's that's wicked cool. Oh, yes. they the look do- awesome. Jacob didn't take a donut. What's up? It's coming around. <laughs> you want to split around. one? Jacob's, Jacob's not going to. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I had one earlier. So. <laughs> <laughs> As we are making lovely mouth noises, enjoying <laughs> these cider donuts. This is this is not. Maybe you could tell us a little bit, Lenita. But what else if we came came to Blossoming Acres Farm Stand in Southwick? What else we would find besides all these lovely bakery treats? So in the spring, you'll find bedding plants, hanging baskets, vegetable starts. A lot of veggies. This time of year, we have Christmas trees. We have wreaths. We have pottery from local. We we, we try to get a, a lot of local crafters for the Christmas season. Pottery, soap, lotion, whatever we can get that's local or as local as we can. Just trying to highlight the area a bit. Yeah. So potentially, if you still had money left on your card, you could buy your Christmas tree with your CSA money. <laughs> you could. Money. That's you amazing. Could. Or not make do any baking for all the uh, events you might be yes. going to and yes. coming to the Blossoming Acres Farm and, and getting pies. Yeah. Yeah, you have a giant list of possible pies that you can order to take home. Hanukkah's underway right now, so mm-hmm. you may be under the wire if you need a Hanukkah pie for some reason or another, but Christmas is still a couple weeks away. Yeah. Do you have to get them in by a certain time so that you're not cranking out like we... Santa in his workshop on uh, the night before Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> well, we do that anyway. But we take orders generally right up to 24 hours ahead. Uh-huh. Um, there are a few times where if we are getting low on one certain type of pie or what we need to make it, we may cut it off. But for the most part, we will take orders up to 24 hours ahead of time. All right. So. Should we dig into that pie, Jacob? I think I might have to. Well, first tell me how the cider donut was. The cider yes. donut is so good. It's also got a tiny bit of like spice to 
it. Mm-hmm. Like it's not yes. a spicy donut, but it's not it's not just straight up sweet. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. sweet and spicy, and I like that. Yeah. It's not it too spicy. sweet, no. which is awesome. Right. Also yeah. love that. That's yeah. way too big a piece of pie for me. Well, it's two pieces, Monty, but <laughs> right. the spatula you got does not take just one piece. <laughs> Out of the pie. We need to go back to Spatula oh. City. Spatula City! Spatula City! We sell spatulas. <laughs> and that's all! And that's all! I'm gonna have to do extra push ups and sit ups at Kung Fu tonight. <laughs> mm. okay. It's still warm! Perfect. Liberating this pie. Oh. Is that what we're calling it? <laughs> I, I, don't know how I, feel. I don't know why I'm struggling to get it out of the pie place. Like, Hang on there, pie! Yourself. I'll save you! <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this pie, Lanita. Well, we make them with apples from Granville, Mountain Orchard in Granville. Mm -hmm. Uh, This particular batch is made with Crispins or what? Well, our matsus, they used to be called matsus, and now they've changed the name to Crispins, Mm -hmm. which are a a yellow type apple, a pie apple. We try to use all pie type apples. Um, We use our favorite is Rome, which we also get from Mountain Orchard. It's an old variety. Oh, thank you. (laughs) And this is apple crumb. Apple and apple crumb are our top two pies for the whole year. Springtime, strawberry rhubarb is the top. Yeah. So I'm pro (laughs) apple crumb because it means that I can be lazy and I only have to make one crust. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) No rolling and fitting, no lattices, no nothing. Just get it in the tin and call it good. My 16-year-old Enzo has mastered the pie and the lattice and all that stuff. He's really good. Really? That's great. Well, I just had a bite of this, and I think I feel a little bit better about my struggles to get it out of the pie plate because it just melted in my mouth. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And again, still warm. Doesn't get much better than that. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you. Anything else before we just stuff our face? <laughs> <laughs> There's an event this weekend. Oh, there is. Yes, yeah, Santa's coming this weekend. Yeah, let's talk about, <laughs> about coming to the farm and um, using whatever's left of your CSA share, possibly getting a new CSA share and meeting Santa. Yes, we will be. Santa will be there on Saturday and Sunday. Pets are welcome. Leashed pets, <laughs> Santa said, as long as they're well behaved. <laughs> so, That's important. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We checked Santa. with Santa before we uh, invited the pets. But <laughs> so yeah, and all we're asking is uh, we're doing a food pantry donation, and they are requesting hygiene products. The oh, Suffolk nice. Food Pantry. Oh, cool. So that's one thing that they're short on, and we thought we could help. So that's that's this weekend, and then from there on, it's pies. It's not often you can get pies with your farm share or Christmas trees with your farm share, but that is one of the things that you can get at Blossoming Acres Farm and Farm Stand in Southwick. And we've been joined by Lanita Bobert, who's given us these wonderful cider donuts and pies to help insulate us from the cold weather, which is coming. Uh, And Jacob Nelson from CISA, the local hero. Folks, you can find out about all of our local heroes and all of the farm shares that will be beginning for 2024 by going to buylocalfood.org. A listener reached out and asked us to remind you that certain banks sometimes offer 0% farm share loans, which where people get six months to pay back the farm share at 0%. So if, you might want to check in with your bank. If getting a farm share is something you're interested in, they might be able to help. Kalise and I were talking yesterday about holiday lights. And no matter what your uh, particular traditions might be, this is the time of year where the light wants to return. And holiday lights of any kind can sometimes bring that light a little more swiftly. And I was driving on Wildwood Street in Greenfield and somebody had this incredible tree that looks like it was taken right out of Dr. Seuss. It's the only tree in the neighborhood, but from top to bottom, it is got these crazy huge bright ornaments and the whole tree is lit up. So It's like everybody in the neighborhood decided to put their effort on that one tree. And you know what? I'm not mad at it. It's so cool looking. We're going to share that picture with you maybe. We, I can yes. send yeah, we'll put it on our social media, but we will. it begged the question, where are the best lights? And they might be in like your neighborhood or the neighborhood like next over. Maybe it's like that creepy house on the hill that you weren't sure somebody lived in, but all of a sudden for one month out of the year is just lit up like hotcakes. If you know where the best lights are around you, we'd love to hear about it. So we, we're not going to you know, be weird about going to people's houses, yeah. but we want to see the cool lights. Yeah, we do. And we're not excluding like public displays either. Like Forest Park does a display that's real fun. And I remember going around to like our parks near like where I grew up or not really grew up, where my family lives in D.C. because I didn't grow up there, but um, where my family lives and like just driving around to see their displays. And that's fun, too. If one of those speaks to you, let us know about it so that we can share the love of the light with our listeners you in these e- dark dark days yeah email us at <laughs> the fab 413 at nepm 
org. Send Tomo- us pictures, too, not just voice memos. We want to see yeah. if you have a chance to take a picture of it. We'd love that. It would be very cool. Tomorrow on The Fabulous 413, we'll talk with the cutest couple in nuclear disarmament. Northampton's Tim and Wallace and Vicki Elson on the Nuclear Weapon Bans Treaty. How they worked with Congressman McGovern to testify on its behalf in front of the United Nations and on Timmons new book. And... How they found love by trying to stop the bomb. Plus more on Jurassic Armored Mud Balls, Dinosaur Footprints, and Everlasting Gobstoppers coming to Dino Fest in Greenfield this weekend. And more were a Word of the Year wannabes with word nerd Emily Brewster from Springfield-based Merriam-Webster. None of the runners-up have anything to do with Elon Musk this week, we think. We're pretty sure. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I am Khalees Smith. We will see you tomorrow on The Fabulous 413.